à l'Indien et éventuellement aussi répondre à des questions sur la lettre que j'ai récemment aux peuples autochtones. Je tiens d'abord à souligner que les instances des organismes de l'Église catholique au Canada qui étaient directement impliquées dans les pensionnats indiens ont demandé pardon collectivement et individuellement. Uh, an apology asked La conférence des uh, made an apology. A fait the conference of bishops reflected that apology, and that apology was confirmed publicly and officially by Pope uh, uh, John II and Benoit XVI. The Catholic bishops are now following up on that request for an apology. They are doing that uh, through a number of pastoral initiatives by pledging uh, to move towards reconciliation and by practicing Uh, an ongoing dialogue. En fait, Indeed, the structure of the Catholic Church uh, fosters a response uh, and uh, local et engagement. Ce qui est le plus and that nécessaire. is what is most needed right now. Je aussi un I would also like to correct uh, a misunderstanding with respect to uh, the Pope's response in the letter. Sa ne First of all, his answer only dealt with the uh, call to action 58 with strict parameters. Cet appel that uh, surrounded that call. Second, the bishop, the pope, never uh, determined that he would withdraw from uh, a process of reconciliation which is underway in various dioceses across Canada. Third, we will see at the appropriate time how his participation can continue uh, to be felt. Fourth, uh, nous devons laisser se déployer les démarches We need to continue local action to uh, foster a closer relationship with the indigenous peoples where the bishops will take on a leadership role. Fifth, the Saint Père. Est ouvert the Holy à Father is open to the Canada. idea of a visit to Canada at the appropriate time, as he states it. And we expect that visit to most certainly include uh, sincere and meaningful meetings with the indigenous people as part of what uh, the previous pope did in his meetings uh, with the indigenous people in 2009. Mes confrères, les évêques du Canada and et my brothers who are part of the Catholic bishops are determined uh, to respond to the suffering of uh, the indigenous people. We feel tremendous solidarity with them, and that is our pastoral priority. The Bible, uh, and this well before the report came out, the Bible uh, calls on us to do that. Alors, so Monseigneur I would now Richard Gagnon invite uh, Mr. Richard Gagnon to say a few words. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Gagnon. I am the Archbishop of Winnipeg and currently serving as Vice President of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops and also uh, my second term as the President of the Western Bishops uh, from Winnipeg to Vancouver. So a short little uh, introduction here. Uh, I would like to point out that when Pope Benedict in 2009 received the delegation of indigenous representatives as well as bishops and religious, religious men and women, and then the national chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Mr. Phil Fontaine, said, quote, this visit with the Holy Father, it closes the circle of reconciliation. In the past, we received apologies from the Anglican, United, Presbyterian churches, and the Government of Canada for the residential schools. Today's expression of understanding, acknowledgement, and emotion by His Holiness on behalf of the Catholic Church closes a circle." End quote. In his statement to the Pope, Chief Fontaine also wisely and perceptibly said that healing the wounds of the residential school legacy will take years, perhaps even decades, 
of work. The bishops of Canada and all the Catholic faithful understand and humbly accept that challenge which is before them. I have a few thoughts about the motion, which I understand is being tabled this afternoon in the House of Commons. At least an earlier draft talked in terms of a moral obligation to resume best efforts to raise the full amount outlined in the 2006 settlement agreement. As you know, a judicial decision determined that the Catholic entities had met the terms of the agreement, and the then Conservative government issued a release, which the present Liberal government chose not to appeal. The entities paid $29 million in cash, and considerably more than the required $25 million of in-kind contributions, in addition to $3.7 million raised in their best efforts campaign. Nevertheless, the entities themselves, as well as other Catholic dioceses, institutes and national organizations, have continued to develop new and extensive initiatives in collaboration with Indigenous communities. Catholics in our country fully respect and continue to carry out the spirit of the settlement agreements. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Irving Papineau. Apologies, I cannot be with you in person, but the recent weather conditions and other travel plans make it impossible for me to leave Akwazasne and be seated with you in Ottawa today. I am a member of the Mohawk First Nations and Vice Chair of the Canadian Catholic Aboriginal Council. The Aboriginal Council is an initiative started approximately 20 years ago by the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. So it would be directly part of the dialogue among dioceses, religious institutions, and Indigenous peoples. The Aboriginal Council serves as the equivalent of an Episcopal Commission within the conference, and its members are Indigenous delegates as well as bishops. Its mandate, membership, and staffing were recently expanded. Its current purpose is to advise the Conference on Indigenous Concerns relating to catechesis, liturgies, evangelization, and pastoral accomplishment, dialogue with traditional Indigenous spiritual leaders, formation of clergy, seminarians, and pastoral personnel, as well as the conference's possible response to social issues of special concern to Indigenous peoples, such as education, fresh water, addictions, and abuse. This council represents a slight representation of the diversity among Native people across Canada. My participation in this council reaffirmed my knowledge that there is much diversity among Canada's Native population. My community here at Akwesasne is a small part of that. And what seems to work in initiatives that are started here would not necessarily fit in another community in another location. So therefore, I would wish to stress that one approach does not fit all communities in Canada. And there has to be a tailor and fit of the initiatives underway that are appropriate for that community. I'd like to leave you with a point that I would make this afternoon, is that in my community of Akwesasne, the question of an apology or a visit by the Pope is not talked about that much. The real issues here are those of the conditions of my people that are living in. I hope this afternoon to emphasize what is needed 
the most and at this moment is not more words but local initiatives and programs and recently we have experienced a higher number of deaths in our community and we are beginning to wonder if, if this is environmental we have had environmental issues here before and we are wondering if those initiatives to clean those up were not appropriate. However, I wish to sign off now and continue this meeting. Thank you. Uh, just explain very, very simply why the Pope can't or won't apologize to the victims of residential schools for the role of the Catholic Church. Could you explain it very simply? Well, I think the first thing I would say to that is that the Pope never said he wouldn't apologize. Uh, what, what the Holy Father did say is that he would not personally respond to Call to Action 58, but almost in the same breath, he mentioned that he is open to considering to come to Canada, and uh, certainly by his actions around the world, uh, in defense of indigenous rights all over the world, uh, it would seem that he would have a significant encounter with indigenous people in Canada, listen to their, their concerns, and respond to them. So the impression, I think, that some people have that the Pope will not apologize or refuse or turns his back on indigenous people is, is, is a misconception. Then? I'm saying he's open to coming to Canada. But I that's can't. That's not an apology. Is he uh, open to apologizing? Uh, the, what the Pope says to Indigenous people uh, is something that he will determine according to what he thinks is best, pastorally speaking. But at the same time, I, you should consider that just a year ago or two years ago, he made an apology in Bolivia to Indigenous people. Uh, relative to the effects of colonialism. So we have a track record with this Pope uh, who is not afraid to confront the hard issues and when there is injustice that he apologizes for that. So I can't, I can't articulate exactly what the Pope will say or how he will say, but you look at the way that he carries on his pastoral ministry and one can see that very clearly. Are you saying that he thinks he's just waiting to come to Canada to make an apology? Is that what you're saying? He's open to considering coming to Canada. Uh, he has been invited to Canada uh, from the Prime Minister, from three of our presidents of the Catholic Conference of Bishops in Canada, including Monsignor Jean Dron, has invited the Pope to come. So he knows that. Uh, his response had to do with call to action number 58, and it's rather strict confines that that call to action called for. Um, He's open to coming to Canada. He's open to consider coming to Canada at the opportune time. His, his mind is always focused on what is pastorally effective. He regards this not as a, a political matter, but as a pastoral matter. And so he's giving deep thought to this. I should also add, if I may, that he's very much aware of the TRC and the, and the conclusion. He's not at all ignorant to this. He knows exactly what has been said. And uh, I can say with, with all honesty and sincerity, he has a place in his heart for Indigenous people. There's no doubt about that from his international track record. It's so strict about conference. the confines of 58. It, seemed, it asked for a papal apology similar to that given to victims of sexual abuse from the church in, in Ireland. So why do those victims get an apology but residential school survivors don't. In Ireland, the, the Holy Father wrote a letter to the Irish. Uh, number 58 specifies that the Pope come to Canada within a certain period of time, a very narrow period of time, and give an apology. So there's a difference between the two. Would you concern about the motion that's before the House? <laughs> Directed to myself or to my well, John? yourself on that. Okay. So. Are, are, the call to action doesn't indicate a specific period of time, so yes, why it is does. That? It well, I can read it here. to you if you want. Yeah. I mean, so, do you want me to read the whole thing? I don't, I don't know. 
58. Number 58. Yeah, that's what I'm reading here. So it says, Within the year. We call upon the Pope to issue an apology to survivors, their families, and communities for the Roman Catholic Church's role in the spiritual, cultural, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children in Catholic-run residential schools. We call for that apology to be similar to the 2010 apology issued to Irish victims of abuse and occur. Oh, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about Within that. Within one but year of issuing it. You have to read the fine print. Yeah, but... <laughs> so, 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 I'm sorry, that. yes. The, the, the motion, what's your concern about that? I think for us, uh, our, our concern is that uh, it's important to clear up any misconceptions that may be out there and, uh, and to correct any inaccuracies because if you're going to have a debate uh, about an important issue as this, it's important to have that wider sense of the topic and one of the misconceptions is that the Catholic Church has not apologized. And many people will say that. But the facts are something different. But Matchett, you know, Colin Matchett says that Fontaine says that you're actually sort of spreading misinformation by using his words from 2009 and taking them out of context. I mean, he said in an interview yesterday that you're taking the whole thing out of context because at the time, it was right for the time, but that was before <coughs> the TRC, you know, reported that 6,000 Indigenous children had died in uh, residential schools, which the Catholic Church against yeah. various orders. So he's saying you're the one who's actually twisting words here. So I'm just wondering how you'd respond to that. I don't know. Why would you use his words without his knowledge? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I didn't uh, hear what he said, so it's hard for me to respond to that. But uh, even though it doesn't take away from the importance of that co encounter with Pope Benedict at the time. Using that to bolster your argument, saying that there's mis conceptions being pushed around about this and you're actually taking words out of context so it's like he that's what he's saying it's reported on the record so you you know yeah you didn't well, hear what he said but ahead. it's on the record so how do you respond well that is what he said recently so, I mean, I heard it, not only that time, but also he uh, met with all of the Canadian bishops and he said it was very important to move forward on this and that the Catholic Church, uh, the, what the best thing the Catholic Church could do for Indigenous peoples would be to help with their education. And at the time, I was very surprised to hear that. Now, perhaps we quoted him because that's exactly what he said. If he has changed his mind, he certainly has the right to do that. And there's no doubt that uh, the TRC uh, looked at the problem in greater depth, and there's no doubt about that. So I think that uh, the current position of the conference uh, uh, is very much in keeping with the position we took and which was ratified, which was uh, to work locally, to work uh, uh, at the local level where we can really make uh, interpersonal contact. Of course, it's easy to say, I'm asking for an apology, but that has to translate into action. There have to be hands and feet joined with that. And the Pope is saying that personally he cannot, and I cannot explain the Pope's reasons, but I can try and guess, and I imagine that one of them is that what he's saying to us as bishops is, not only to bishops, but to the Catholic Church as a whole, uh, we have to continue because for a very long time now we have been working with the indigenous peoples so what we need to do is pursue that action in order to benefit them. And that will probably, as he said, be part of the tempo importuno. It will probably uh, happen in due, t in due course. With your arguments that you put forward, you're saying we said this thing in 1991, this thing happened in 2009. But new information has emerged. And you're also saying that, well, it's not the Catholic Church with these orders. But the thing is, is that as more historical documents get released, now we know that the Cardinal and Archbishop of, you know, in Quebec and the Archbishop in St. Boniface were actually lobbying heavily to have the Department of Indian Affairs uh, push sick children with TB for instance, schools into Catholic sanatoriums. They wanted, to, they wanted the Indian Affairs Department to create a Catholic, like at the upper echelons, 
the church in Canada at cardinal level were involved in pushing the system. And on top of that, your bishop from Moussigny was investigated by the OPP for what happened in St. Anne's where you had an electric chair, you had just, you know, all this, like, you know, there's two nuns got, got convicted for the, oh, for the system no, of charity who you're now, you know, you're, you're honoring Elizabeth Briere, right, for her work, but her order had two nuns convicted for what they did in St. Anne's. Mm. So I'm just wondering, you know, your argument is that the Catholic Church has no connection to this. No, we never said uh, that at all. On the contrary, the churches are responsible, the conference is responsible, but your senior officials were involved. Ce qui est dit, c'est sûr que ça vient de ce que nous sommes. Obviously, what is being said comes from what we are. But in a way, the Episcopal Conference in Canada is not like the Anglican Church or the United Church. Structurellement, là, c'est très Structurally différent. Speaking, Alors, we're very nous, c'est un, c'est un genre de confédération. So we're sort On of a confederation. We come together les uns les autres. to c'est sûr support que each other. Reconnaît But certainly, the Catholic Church uh, recognizes that it has uh, done wrong in the past. Well, what do you want me to say? <laughs> well, just, just like respond how like you have cardinals involved, bishops involved, well, bishops under investigation, nuns convicted. You're saying we're we're a, you know a decentralized you know organization, but in fact you had cardinals and bishops and archbishops all involved in this according to the historical records. So, well, I mean, well, but when when there are bishops, cardinals involved, it's not the whole church. <laughs> but they're. No. There's a link between the Vatican and like what's happened in Canada. How can you say they're not the whole church? We're talking about the Catholic Church in Canada. The, the historical record shows they were involved and they were lobbying for changes in the way residential schools were run. And they wanted sick kids with TB to go to Catholic sanatoriums to save their souls, mm-hmm. right? So this, like, this is like archbishops, cardinals. Isn't mm-hmm. there a connection between the cardinal and the Vatican? Yes, but not what you think. <laughs> it's not, you know, a cardinal is uh, can say whatever he wants as long as is, he is in communion. No, I, I think that there are wrongs in the Catholic Church, and this has been said many times. Uh, bishops with the uh, residential schools, communities with residential schools, collectively and individually have expressed apologies. And uh, I think, you know, well, we don't, we don't know what the Pope is going to do. What we know is that I've seen him once uh, meeting with people who had been abused personally, and they came out of that meeting completely transformed because he had truly compassion. He suffered truly with them. So he, he might come and express compassion or whatever he wants. You're yeah, making it very confusing. None of us know what's going on. Um, if, if this resolution, number 58, is amended so that the time frame is taken out, is that what the stumbling block is? He doesn't want to be boxed into a year-long time frame if it was taken out. He'd be okay with it to come in three years, or like you really have to state clearly: is he is he going to apologize or not? We're getting bogged down here. None of us know what's happening. Well, he's the only one who can give answer to that. Well, under the impression he well, said no. So, so yeah, what's yeah. Going well, on? Was he ever, but, was but he he, oh, he he didn't say no. He said that he would not respond to fifty-eight, and. Yeah, so you both so we both put another, you both put a particular attention on the time frame. Both of you no, no, uh, unsolicited no, no. said, Well, there's a time frame issue. Is that the issue? No, it's not the issue, I don't think so. So what is the issue? What's the problem? What's the issue? Has, has the Pope sought your advice and what was it? Did you tell him to come and apologize? Well, as it is written in the letter, he's been sh- speaking and this year, well the last year, all the different regents went to, to Rome for what we call the ad limina visitation. And there is no doubt that he met. You know, well, usually in the church, the Pope would come and speak to the people. Well, with Francis, 
He said, well, while we are all here together, who's going to kick the ball? And so we begin and we share, and he shared about that, there is no doubt. And the presidency visitation also that we do yearly, we've been discussing that, there is no doubt. One of the other fundamental questions is, is your answer that an apology as such has been made, or is your fundamental answer that it's not for the Pope to make an apology? Yeah, I think, I think one way of looking at that would be the misconception that exists in some people's minds is that the church has never apologized. And uh, there's, there's examples of the apologies all the way from all the, those entities and dioceses and orders in Canada who had a direct connection with residential schools. And as a matter of fact, uh, Pope, Pope Benedict and John Paul II also, and then Francis internationally. So that, that, that is a response to that. But when he, when he says he is, open, he is open to considering to come to Canada, you know, he's not saying he will not apologize because if you place Pope Francis among indigenous people and he hears these horrible stories, what do you think he's going to say? You know, well, I, I, does he have to be placed amongst them? Doesn't he know the stories already? So can't he decide now? Does he have to come here? before he figures out if he's going to apologize? Doesn't he know now that he, whether or not he'll apologize? Well, uh, number 58 specified that he does come to Canada, and the Holy Father said that he, that he can't personally respond to that, but he's open to coming to Canada because I think one of, the, one of his uh, strong points is his engagement with people on a personal basis. And obviously, the situation in Canada is a very important situation with regards to the sufferings of ad Aboriginal people. So I think it's wonderful that he's open to coming to Canada at an opportune time. You know, so... Have you communicated directly with... Let me flip the question the, here for a second. What benefit do you see in the Pope not apologizing? There is a resistance there. So what is it from your perspective that there is some benefit to him not coming here and not apologizing? I don't feel any resistance at all, at all. He's 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 most welcome to come to Canada. There's, there's, there's no resistance. So Here's the question: Would you encourage him to come? Would you encourage him? Would the CCCB encourage him? Has the encouraged him formally to come and apologize now? We have invited him to come to Canada, uh, and among that, various points of contact when he comes here would be a significant meeting with Indigenous people. And the Pope knows that this has to do with the expression of sorrow and regret to indigenous people who have suffered. You don't have to tell the Pope you must apologize. He knows that. Directly with the Pope. Have you communicated directly with the Pope? What do you think the Pope will say if he comes to Canada and meets with indigenous survivors? I cannot. I cannot speculate what the Pope will say, but as I mentioned before. His track record is precisely that. Do you think he should apologize? Or do you, think that, do you believe, believe he should, should come and apologize? apologize? Uh, I think uh, I agree with the way the Pope is handling this in terms of waiting for an opportune time and also that he encourages on the local level initiatives to, con to continue in Canada, for sure. And uh, it's part of our Christian faith, obviously, when there's injustice, that you that you express apologies and ask for forgiveness. That's that that goes without saying. That's not a that's not a that's not a no brainer. That's a that's a simple thing. So, yeah, so, so can you just can you just tell us can you just tell us is liability an issue for you? You know, because just because of a miscommunication. The the Pope for the last few times, well I should say it in French probably, y a souvent parlé de trois mots qui sont fondamentaux pour vivre l'Évangile. To live he to the gospel, has uh, words. said and a number of times he that he wants is, to live by the Bible. Me. So, and it, it ends with thank you. So, so, so he'll, he'll, he'll can you just, can you just, so on can you a scale answer, of one to ten, it, what are the chances of apologizing? Because I'm sure you can come here. Can you just tell us about the 25 million that, that you guys were not found, you were got out of because of a miscommunication? Are you concerned that an apology makes you liable? 
Could you? Have you communicated okay. directly with the Archbishop, 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 could you just go and summarize then what's going to happen with the Pope? I'm, I'm just wondering if the motion passes, will it negatively affect the Pope's decision? Archbishop, no one, no one really understands whether or not the Pope is yes, no, or maybe.
Good afternoon. We are here today um, representing members of our caucus, uh, Chair Nantel, my colleague Romeo Saganash, I'm Charlie Angus from Tim and James Bay. Uh, we also have Evelyn Corkmonts, who's a spokesperson for the survivors of St. Anne's Residential School, because their fight for justice goes on. Today, the House of Commons will have a historic opportunity to move the yardstick on reconciliation. By closing that dark chapter of the residential schools, by calling upon the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops to respond to the call of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to make the formal invitation to Pope Francis to apologize. This motion is being brought forward because of our deep concern when we heard that Pope Francis said that he was not in a position to apologize. And our concern was heightened by the pastoral letter of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops to Indigenous Canadians, where they did not mention the issue of residential schools once in that letter. And we are very distressed today to see their appearance on Parliament Hill to oppose this motion and to engage in obfuscation of the historic facts that has to be called out. Because we were taught in the Catholic schools that you have to make your yes mean yes and your no mean no. You have to speak the truth to power. For the Canadian Catholic bishops to state in 2018 that, quote, the Catholic Church as a whole in Canada was not associated with the residential schools, end quote, pushes this church towards very irresponsible historical revisionism. It is not acceptable, not after what we learned in the Truth and Reconciliation. The church and the bishops were intimately involved in the development and the promotion of the residential schools. The bishops were the champions, the defenders, the colluders, and in many cases, the abusers in that brutal system. And this historic record cannot be obfuscated today in 2018. And today, the Catholic Church of Canada is deeply involved in the residential school issue. Its lawyers are involved at every step of the way. The Catholic Church in Canada is given access to the testimony of every single survivor. They have access to every claim that has been made by the IEP. And for the survivors of St. Anne's Residential School in my region, who are still fighting for justice, they tell me it is very cold comfort to know that the institution that abused them not only receives the notices of their confidential hearings, but the church has the right to review every single decision. And the lawyers for this institution have signed off on the documents at every step of the way. To state that the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops cannot undertake an apology because, quote, the Catholic Church is a decentralized structure, every diocese bishop is autonomous, is a ridiculous statement. The CCCB is the voice of the Catholic Church in Canada. They have published numerous public statements over the years on behalf of the Canadian Catholic Church on matters relating to social and political life in this country and around the world. They are the voice of the Canadian Catholic Church. And the children who were forcibly taken away from their homes across this country and who were indoctrinated in the church, they were taught every single morning to recite the words of the Nicene Creed which says, we believe in one holy Roman and Catholic apostolic church. They were not taught to say, we believe in a series of independent entities that have been set up to protect assets and limit liabilities for crimes. And the notion that the Pope is somehow not in a position to make the apology because he has to defer to individual bishops is even less credible because the Catholic Church and I have grown up in this tradition, and I have loved this tradition. But it is structured on a hierarchical principle of Matthew 18. To the message to Peter, that Peter, you are the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever is loosed on earth will be loosened in heaven. That is the power of the Pope to make the apology and to respond to the truth and reconciliation. And each of the Christian orders who were involved in this horrific series of crimes have stepped up and made the formal apologies and paid their indemnifications. In fact, the Anglican Diocese paid their full share and the largest single amount came from the Diocese of Toronto, which technically 
did not be involved in any way in the residential schools, but the descendants and the parishioners in Toronto felt that they had that moral obligation. In terms of the apologies that have been said, there has not been a single apology by any order or anyone in the church that has recognized the systemic nature of the crimes. Uh, certainly, Pope Benedict expressed his personal sorrow about the actions of some bad actors, but that is in no way representative or response to the truth and reconciliation call where the Catholic Church has to recognize that this system and admit that this system was systemic. It was set up to destroy Indigenous identity through the forceful removal of children and the abuse of these children. And we have great hope that Pope Francis, who's been a champion of reconciliation and justice, is set to recall, to respond to this call for healing and closure. He needs to receive this call from the Canadian Catholic Conference of Bishops. We are calling on all members of Parliament to stand with us today to make this motion. This motion will go forward, either unanimous consent or by debate, but it will come through because the historic time has come for the Catholic Church in Canada to join the work of reconciliation, to walk on the road as a penitent and as a partner and in recognition of the crimes that were committed under their watch. Very briefly then, when I heard that the Pope was refusing to apologize to the survivors of the residential schools, I was obviously very disappointed after hearing what the bishops said today, I can tell you that I am now disgusted. For a pope who claims to have a social conscience, and he has shown that in other contexts, well, he ha if he has that social conscience, he must apologize to the survivors of the residential schools and apologize for all the things the Catholic Church is responsible for. I share Charlie's opinion when he says you cannot separate those entities. The Catholic Church is a single entity. And for that reason, the Catholic Church must apologize to former survi to survivors. As you know, I survived 10 years of residential school. It's important to me that he do that. That is the missing part of the puzzle that will take us towards reconciliation. And that applies to all survivors. And I'd just like to add with respect to what has been said, that it's very difficult for me to have sat through that entire press conference and listened to them, particularly since uh, while you were asking questions, they laughed a couple of times at your questions. There is nothing more insulting than what I saw there today. And I think it's important that you be aware of that. When you uh, refuse to allow the survivors to talk about their experience uh, in their residential schools, 10 years of experiences, uh, I mean, when you invite them to talk about what they went through, to relive those, the traumatism, uh, the trauma that they experienced. Well, I mean, that is why I join with my colleague, Charlie Angus, in supporting that motion, and I want to thank my colleague, Pierre Nantel, as well.
J'ai dit au caucus aujourd'hui, je n'aurais pas vous le dire. I told the caucus today, and I shouldn't tell you that, because what is said in caucus is secret. But what I did say to the caucus today was, don't be surprised que je ne prenne pas la parole if I do not speak sur cette motion en on the motion when it comes forward in the House, for the very reasons that I have just given you. It's very difficult for us to relive those moments. It's very difficult for us to talk Même about what we went through, even after several decades. Mais je pense que But au nom de I think that on behalf of all of the survivors right across Canada, on behalf of our parents as well, ma mère I lost my mother, et mes parents ont perdu and my parents la grande majorité lost de leurs enfants most of their children in the hands of those pas residential Québec, schools, not just in Quebec, but all across Québec, the country. I went to a residential school in Quebec. Others were moi, sent to, to uh, Sault Ste. Marie Bram uh, or to Brampton or to various other places in uh, Ontario. Uh, there was one EP. 2,000 Donc, kilometers from West Winnipeg. Parler, so it's difficult for us to talk about this. But I want to thank Charlie my colleague Charlie for taking this initiative, for showing leadership on this issue by proposing vers, this vers motion. That takes us one step closer to place, reconciliation. And I will remain uh, here if there are any questions. I see that there are quite a few of you here. And most of you are English-speaking uh, journalists, so I will answer any questions you have afterwards. My name is Evelyn Corkmass. I am a member of Fort Albany First Nations. I am a St. Anne's residential school survivor. I am here representing Edmund Matatawaban and the St. Anne's survivors who are continuing to fight for justice. Many survivors live far away and were not able to come in such short notice. There is no doubt in my mind I was raised in St. Anne's Residential School and I lived in the Catholic Church faith and I was taught that the highest authority on earth was the Pope in Rome. We were all taught that indig indigenous ways of worship were the work of the devil. We were raised in an institution run by the Catholic Church. Legal decoy don't apply. What was done to us as children was a crime against humanity. For survivors and our families and our children, We asked the Catholic Church to do the right thing. We continue to live the, live the harms of being abused in these schools. The Catholic Church has a large part to play in the government's residential school policy. All the Canadian officials in the Catholic Church already signed the settlement agreement 11 years ago agreeing to these terms. Re reconciliation is important to survivors and our families and all Canadians to put this dark chapter behind us. Never again. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Senator Murray Sinclair. I'm um, the former chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And <clears throat> I have something to say about failure of the Catholic Church to call upon or to assist the Pope to make the apology that we called upon them uh, and the Pope to make as part of the calls to action for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. <clears throat> we said what we said in 2015 as part of our report for a good reason. It was necessary for the healing of those survivors who went to the Catholic residential schools. It was also necessary for the healing of this country. It was also necessary for the healing of those who worked on behalf of the church to acknowledge that their leadership was standing up on their behalf and taking responsibility for directing them to do what they 
had done. We met with many people who worked in, in residential schools, uh, some of them on behalf of the Catholic uh, schools that were created. Over 70% of residential schools in Canada were run by the Catholic Church and Catholic entities. And people who worked in those schools often talked about the fact that they were directed and told what exactly their marching orders were when they were teaching and working with the children. They were told that it was expected of them that they would use harsh disciplinary methods in order to require the children to learn what it meant to be a good Christian child in this country. They were following the directions of the church when they did what they did. And now for the church to hide behind its legal creations, the various legal congregations, the legal entities that it created, is a shame. I think it's a shame because it's not appropriate. More than that, though, those of us in the legal community who have done any amount of work around situations like this would be able to tell you easily that we have no difficulty looking behind corporate charades like the Catholic Church has created in order to protect itself and its assets from uh, legal actions and litigation such as those that were brought by the survivors of residential schools initially. We know that those entities were created for the express purpose of protecting the central assets of the church. And we know that wherever matters have gone to litigation, the church, the church itself has attempted to hide behind those legal entities it has created, usually without success, but often it has resulted in directions by those in charge of the church in Canada or in the United States or the Vatican generally to settle the case before the issue actually comes to judgment because the last thing that the church wants is for a court to declare that their legal corporations that they've created over the years, and there are thousands of them <coughs> that they've designed to protect their assets, that those legal corporations can easily be pierced and that people can go behind them. And it is a shame that they would now attempt to stand behind the, those entities that they've created to say that the church does not bear responsibility, but that those legal entities do. The reality is that everybody who worked for those entities was directed by the church as to what to do. The church named all of the directors of those corporate boards. The church directed those entities on how to do their work. The church, in fact, took money from those entities as part of the fundraising for the church and use and, and use that money for part of the church work. And so for now, now for them to say that they did not benefit, they did not have any responsibility, is not only legally wrong, but it's a shame. And they should feel shame. Those who have made the decision not to allow the Pope to issue this apology are now taking on their own responsibility for continuing this lack of healing. But I also have a great deal of sympathy for those survivors who continue to follow the faith of the church. My grandmother would have been one of them if she were alive today because she was a very strong Catholic. She went to a residential school and she was raised as a Catholic and she died as a Catholic. And she would have stood behind her church all the way, but she also would have appreciated knowing that the church would take responsibility for what it created and the environment that it created not only for her, but for others. Because whether or not any individual could point to any act of abuse that they may have experienced, all children who were placed in residential schools, Catholic, Anglican, United Church, or whichever ones ran them, were all faced with an environment in which their language was destroyed, their culture was destroyed, and efforts were made to ensure that they were indoctrinated into a different way of living. In the TRC report, we identified that as cultural genocide. And cultural genocide is genocide. There's no question that it would, if they tried to do that today, it would fall within the definition of genocide within the United Nations Convention on Genocide. And the government of Canada, if it tried to do that, would be guilty of that offense, as would any other entity that supported it. And let me also point out <clears throat> that in our report, we talk about the fact that in 1950, after the UN Convention on Genocide was passed, the government of Canada attempted to put in place a plan to start to close down the schools. But that, that plan, from the very period of time, point in time when the government made that decision and started to take action to implement that decision, was resisted 
and it was resisted primarily by the Catholic Church. They wanted to keep the schools going. They relied upon the schools for their existence in this country, but more importantly, they believed fervently in the rightness of their way of indoctrinating children. And so it is quite wrong now to fail to live up to their obligation to apologize on behalf of the church to the survivors, to the members of the church congregations, to other Catholics, and to this country for what it was that they have contributed to and to take responsibility for it because now they have indicated through this failure that they are not taking responsibility for what they have done. And I think that's a shame. Thank you. In English, can we just ask you as a parliamentarian and as a survivor what you felt when you heard those church representatives uh, in English? Well, you, you already when the, the, the Pope announced that he wouldn't apologize, I was, uh, of course, as a survivor, very disappointed. And after hearing what they said today, I'm, now I'm disgusted. Um, you probably noticed that I walked out because uh, uh, I wanted to go throw up in a bathroom. Uh, so it's, it's this is very disappointing. This is very disgusting. Uh, you know, saying that uh, the Pope may come to Canada, will have meaningful meetings, les réunions sincères, were the words that they, they chose to express that. Meaningful meetings is, is not an apology in my view, and we need that. What they said, and what do you make of it? We're all still trying to figure out exactly what they said. I did not hear the word apology during that press conference, not once. And it lasted a good 30 minutes, not once that they dared mention that, that word. So I don't think uh, there is a, an intention here to apologize to the survivors of residential school. Not only the survivors, as I mentioned, in, in French, uh, also to the parents that are, that are still around. My mom lost the majority of her 14 children to the hands of residential schools across this country. I was fortunate enough to be just 600 kilometers from, from Osanopi, where I'm from, but some of my siblings were sent 2,000 kilometers away from Osanopi. In different, uh, I think we, we attended four different residential schools as siblings. And that was done purposely as well. So I'd like that apology. My mom is a Catholic as well. She, she believes in this church. And I think she's expecting an apology from her church. Bishop, 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 Bishop said at some point, well, you know, uh, and they, they kind of waffled on it back and forth, but they said, well, we have apologized. And, and they said the church has apologized. The, the, the Pope and other churches have, have given expressions of sorrow <coughs> and regret. Can you please explain to us the difference between expressing sorrow and expressing an apology? Well, um, again, um, Phil Fontaine has called out the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops for misrepresenting his response to Benedict. Um, and Benedict, when he made his statement, it was a powerful statement at the time, but he expressed personal sorrow. And always, they talk about the actions of some. That is not meeting the test of the apology for what we now learn is the systemic system that was established to destroy indigenous identity. And as Senator Sinclair says, meets the test of cultural genocide. Expressing regret is not an apology, not when it is so systemic. And certainly today, um, seeing the prevarications from the Conference of Bishops uh, raises a question of whether, that, uh, whether they fully comprehend the meaning of that apology. You were here, you heard what they said. What do you think they said? Well, I, I think what they said speaks for itself. I think it's very unfortunate um, because the Catholic faith has taught us um, to make your yes mean yes and your no mean no. On Good Friday, I went to Mass, and the talk was how we have to, we have to take accountability for the wrongs that we do. That's how we make the world whole. That's what we've been taught. So to see the bishops talking about legal fictions uh, in the face of the largest criminal act that was conducted in Canadian history is very unfortunate. And I, I am very disturbed because people back home, and Evelyn can speak to that, the survivors of St. Anne started to contact us saying, what do you mean they're not going to apologize? Because again, many have left the church. 
because of their anger. But many stayed loyal to the church because they believed in the teachings that there was a, a better way to be. I think the bishops have let us down uh, dramatically. He seems to be suggesting that he might come, but we don't know what he's going to do when he comes here. They seem to, they, they, they weren't clear at all on what he was going to do. Do you get the impression, if you had to read between the lines, does it look like the Pope is trying to wash his hands of the role of the Catholic I, I Church? I would never think for a moment that Pope Bennett or Pope Francis would wash his hands uh, of this issue because we know that he's taking these issues very seriously. But when he said he was personally not able to respond, uh, and then he said he's been discussions with the C C Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. Our understanding is that it's the, the role of the Canadian Catholic Church to reach out to the Pope and say this has to be done. And we saw recently in Chile where the Pope came out and took the side of the church against the survivors on the expressed advice of the bishops and realized he was led wrong by those bishops. And the Pope last week publicly said he wanted to personally apologize to the survivors in Chile because he had been misled. So our understanding is that the Pope will respond, but what we're not seeing is a willingness, and you saw it today, of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops to say, yes, the role of reconciliation means the full apology. Yes, it means living up. And the, the issue of them meeting their financial gains, they did not pay their financial indemnities. They did not. They walked away on the $25 million that was obligated to be paid to the survivors based on a legal loophole uh, that let them off where they raised $3.7 million and the majority of that money was actually uh, administration fees to the church. So the survivors and Evelyn and her survivors who were still waiting never saw that money whereas the other Christian orders paid up. The reason? The reason? The reason? At the end of the day, is that what this issue is about? The Canadian Catholic Church not wanting to have to pay up? Is that what this is actually about? I'm not sure what it is. I cannot, for the life of Fathom, understand when the Catholic Church has been involved at every step of the way in the residential school apology. Their lawyers have been involved. Uh, they, got, they walked on this legal agreement. And the bishops know that as parliamentarians, we have no legal power to make them live up to that order that they walked away from and through that legal loophole. There is no legal power for the parliament to order the Catholic Church to pay up. This is a moral call to do the right thing. As parliament, and the Parliament of Canada is one of the two defendants in this crime, and the Parliament of Canada under the Conservative Prime Minister apologized for that crime and said they would make right. So for the one defendant to turn to the other defendant and say, the only thing we can ask you to do is to do the moral right thing, uh, what are the bishops afraid of? Because they can ignore this motion if they want, but morally they cannot. We're seeing the timeline, though. The year timeline is an issue, and also the logistics of the Pope coming to Canada. Would an apology be acceptable a year and a half from now, two years from now, uh, a written statement from Vatican City? Survivors would be the one to tell you that. Oh, please. Uh, oh, I can answer you. Right <coughs> Um, I would accept an apology today, tomorrow, next year, two years from now. An apology to me is acknowledgement of the abuse that was done to us as children. That's all we're asking for. It's let's put this issue behind us and move forward. This happened to me as a child. I am now an elder. I am still being abused. They've already acknowledged they've done wrong by putting monies into the AIP settlement. So all we're asking for is a verbal apology to bring these documents out from the dark and put our stories into Canadian history. We are the first people of this country. We were happy before the settlers came. We had our own tradition, our own customs, our own language, our own religion. And then the settlers came, the bishops, the priests, the nuns, and they told us 
we were worship worshipers of the devil. So we took on their new religion. And look where that has got us. Nothing but heartache and pain throughout our life. It's been a long journey. Even today when I seen them up here in their white collars, I turned back into a child and automatically they became the authority figures they were when I was a child. That shouldn't happen. I am an adult now. I need to start my healing journey and move on. And I think we need the help of the Canadian people to help us with this acknowledgement of the wrongs that the Canada government, the Catholic Church, have done to our people. That's all we are asking for. Thank you. Can you tell me just the personal significance to you of what this would mean if the Pope apologized to you personally? I just said it would be an acknowledgement that wrongs were done. That, yes, we did you wrong. We would like to help you on your healing journey so our people can move on. There's high addictions up in the James Bay area where I come from, high suicide. Where do you think this has come from? It's come from the abuse that was done to us, the abuse that was done to our parents, the abuse that was done to our great grandparents. It's time to acknowledge the wrongs. It's time for our people to heal. We accepted the Roman Catholic Church with open arms. And this is the wrong that we have been done. Just an apology. That's all we want. So can you explain what's going to happen this afternoon? Like, are, is, is the motion going to be filed? Will it be voted on today? Will it be debated? What's going to happen? Um, well, we have tried to seek unanimous consent, which means that Romeo and I will be there uh, at the end of question period to, uh, to, to bring forward the motion. Uh, we have the support of the governing party. Uh, the former members of the bloc have expressed their support. Elizabeth May has expressed her support. Uh, surprisingly, the Conservatives have said it'll be a free vote, which we've never heard of for unanimous consent, which means they just need one member on the back bench to whisper no, and it will be defeated. Uh, we think that that would be a very unfortunate move by the Conservatives to uh, impede the voice of Parliament on reconciliation. If that happens, this motion will be brought back for a formal debate where the issues of uh, that we've raised today will be brought forward and it will be a standing vote and every member of parliament will be uh, expected to vote according to their conscience. But as a parliament of Canada, we have to move on this. We have to send the, the, the Pope a clear signal that it's the time is now. This is why it has to come now. One conservative or one person, it will obviously be conservative. Yeah, so one, if you if sit up and watch, and when he asks, do I have unanimous consent, you will note if there's a conservative. This We are very surprised that they haven't just agreed to unanimous okay. consent because, again, it was a conservative prime minister, Stephen Harper, who um, gave that historic apology. And that, to me, was one of the most powerful moments in my life as a parliamentarian was to see that prime minister do that. So I'm surprised that they would uh, not agree. So we shall see at 3 three thirty. Like a we will we will bring it back for debate. It seems that the so part of the reservation is about you know the trampling on the separation of church and state. Do you see your motion as, as that type of an issue that the, the, the powers of church and state are getting uh, trampled on there? Well, I was actually just reading headlines from a bishop, I think, from St. John's who said it was really important for the church to speak on political issues all the time. Um, certainly, I've heard from the church many times on political issues. There's never been a separation on hearing the church's point of view. The fact is, we're talking about a system that was established by two partners, the Parliament of Canada and the Christian denominations, 
to destroy indigenous identity. So the failure of the church to respond to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was set up by the Parliament of Canada, makes it incumbent upon us as the Parliament of Canada, as the voice of the Canadian people, to call upon the Catholic Church to do the right thing. This is not interfering in church decisions about how sacraments are done. This is not about church decisions about any manner of things. This is about their obligation for a system that they worked in hand in hand uh, with the federal government on. And at that, I think we're being told to wrap it up. Yeah, you, but your point of pressure then is not Rome, it's CCCP. Well, um, I, you know, Pope Francis is uh, from the Jesuit order. Uh, the Jesuit order has long been advocates for social justice around the world. Pope Francis has been an outspoken advocate on justice. Uh, it is certainly our belief that it's the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops that seem to be the impediment here. And I would never want people to think that we thought that St. Francis was um, turning his back on the need to find reconciliation with the Indigenous people of Canada. Thank you. Thank you very much. Much to do.